Hello there, everybody. How's it going? Uh, I wanted to invite you all in to a another week of streaming. Uh, I am Bazarkis. I will be guiding you all through a... Uh, hey, how's it going? Knowledge oh, domain. It's great seeing you again. Uh, I will be guiding you through a one-shot that you can run yourself. This one shot is going to be based, uh, let me just change my audio here just a little bit, sorry, I just realized I was going really low. Uh, this is going to be based in uh, my world, but this could absolutely be based in yours. Uh, I am going to be giving you all of the maps, I am going to give you a one page notation for you to run the actual game. I'm going to give you three character sheets for NPCs that you are more than welcome to use. And I'm going to be guiding you through the very beginning of how to set this up for your party, your players, your family, your friends, whomever you want to bring into the game world with you. And I'm going to show you exactly how to do this step by step. So first thing we're going to do is I'm going to be showing you um, the assets you're going to be using. This is the Silver Bastion. Um, this is the top deck. This is the lowest deck of the Silver Bastion. And this is the middle deck. So these are going to be the assets that you're going to import into... Uh, well, that doesn't seem to be working as well as I thought. Um, these are going to be the assets you're going to import into Roll20. Today we're going to show you a Roll20 import. And as we continue on uh, with the stream, I may show you different imports or different things that you can do. Also, too, if you're planning on seeing uh, your friends in person, you'll be able to print these out because they are, um, each one of those squares is one inch squares in real life. So you could actually print these out in a layer of, I believe, four or five sheets, and you can just stack them up on top of each other and make nice boats. So. The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to show you the setup. So you are, I'm assuming, going to be the DM. And what you're going to do is you're going to go to your browser. And on your browser, you're going to go to Roll20. You're going to make yourself a... Uh, you're going to be making yourself an account. When you make yourself an account, all you need to do, put in name, email, that kind of thing. Make sure that you sign in, sign up. Um, you as a dungeon master, if you're going to be starting, you don't need the pro subscription, not yet. Um, it's not it's not a huge deal. I'm going to go to my ongoing streaming campaign. I'm going to launch here. So this way I can just show you all uh, a little bit um, of the ease of access for you to do. So to import something, it's fairly easy. All you're going to do is go over to create a new page, go to Untitled, click on your uh, Assets tab, wherever that's going to be, and then simply click and drag. It uploads, and then when it finishes uploading, uh, there you go. It's now in. There's a trick to being able to resize your items to the exact size that you need. And it has to do with just your, your broad eyes. Do you see the, how the boxes are not lined up right here? What you're going to do is you're gonna, just going to extend it on the corner until you can see that they're mostly lined up. I may have some variations in some places. Um, but you see as I drag that down, that was just freehand. I wasn't attempting to do that perfect on the first try. It just happened that way. So, if you have some trouble, simply just pop it there. That's most likely what's going to happen. You're going to see that, okay, so this area right here is a little bit more scrunched than the others. And I'm noticing that my second line is actually below that, so I need to extend that and make it bigger. I did so. So now when I look at each one of those lines, those appear to line up. Now, as I look at my vertical lines, those appear to line up as well. For the most part, as long as your asset is brought in as a JPEG, you can drag from a corner and that should be able to line it up just fine. Um, and that's kind of a very time consuming thing. I believe Knowledge Domain, 
Uh, absolutely exactly 10 chicken nuggets. That is a skill that I was able to pick up over many years. Uh, is I'm pretty good at reading lips. So when my players have audio issues, sometimes I read their lips until they're able to figure out what's going on. So, um, that is how you get started. Now let's actually go one back. Let's start you out with your very first campaign page. So we're going to go to the home screen on this. Let's create a brand new game. Assuming that you're going to have your players uh, come and join whatever game this is. Start a new game. Your name is going to be... The Riddledium. One Shots. So there's a reason that I want you to choose this specific character sheet, and I'll show you why in just a moment. So you're going to go down, and you're going to go to D&D 5E by Roll20. Um, I'm doing a specifically 5th edition stream so that I can show you the assets that I use uh, to make my streams go very quickly, and it makes a lot of the newer players or players that always wanted to try this but they're nervous about the math or they're nervous if they're going to get something wrong. Uh, this is going to take care of a lot of that for them. So as you scroll down, you'll see, I'm ready. Let's create some games. You have nothing in there. Not a problem. So let's say you wanted to choose a file to have on the backdrop to make them feel a little bit better. Here is my favorite one. Uh, this is one that I have on a lot of my social media, which I did drop into the chat. I hope that you are able to like, share, subscribe, all that jazz. Um, as that loads up, you can start managing your settings. So let's go to our game settings to see what we have currently. Allow public access to this game. You're most likely not going to want to allow this if you have your own players. However, if you're searching for players or you want to put up a looking for party post or LFP, um, you can say that yes this is a public access game uh, for now I'm gonna click yes if anybody would like to join this to be able to go in and run their own games in any of these more than happy for that uh, same background image sure let's keep the same background image so that everybody knows what thing that I have allow player to import their own characters absolutely if they have something that's already built that's a lot less for you to worry about uh, the default game settings so this is something that the default is already pretty good for you. Um, I personally like a bigger width to my pages. I use fairly large uh, game si uh, or uh, game maps, so I usually put mine 40 by 40. This just gives me a lot of free space. I do not usually enable my fog of war unless I want to, which is very very easy to do inside the game. Um, I want the players to be able to see the name of the characters that I create, or that they create. Um, if they have an aura, like they're surrounded by fire, or they're a paladin that has the aura of vitality, I want them to be able to see that as well. Um, I don't like to use dynamic lighting just yet, because my imported maps, uh, I have to do them all over anyway. So it just doesn't work out. The dynamic lighting is something mostly for, for pro users, so I don't even use it. I just prefer the very simple version. Um, the compendium settings are if you buy resources via Roll20. I don't have any resources that I've bought uh, via Roll20. What I do is I buy resources on a different online application, which I'll show you in just a little bit. So. As you can see, the character sheet template is very familiar to you if you've seen uh, Dungeons and Dragons being played on Roll20. Um, and also if you've seen your character sheet in the back of the PHB, uh, or Player's Handbook. This is very indicative of that, so we're just going to go all the way down. Um, the NPC option sets new characters to default to the NPC card style sheets. What that means is that an, if I were to have a character that is placed in and is an NPC, if I roll anything or if I speak as that player, it's going to show up in the little chat box. Um, I don't want to do that because I would actually 
prefer to be more fluid to be able to go in and out of characters because there may be multiple NPCs and interactions at, a th at one time. So therefore it's not as productive for me, but it may be as productive for you. Uh, use level one character mancer for new characters? Absolutely, if you want to make your characters on roll 20. For this tutorial, we're going to make our uh, characters elsewhere. So roll queries. Um, D20 rolls output according to this option. Uh, let me actually zoom this in so it's just a little bit easier for everybody to read. Uh, rolls output according to this option. Always roll uh, with advantage is the setting and ro will roll 2d20 in every roll in case of advantage. Um, I leave this as yes. Uh, always roll advantage if you have to ask if it is at advantage. So if you ask is this at advantage, it is. Uh, if you ask and it's not, then it's not. Whispering the roles to DM, or to the GM, or, or Game Master, uh, which in my case would be me. I always say never whisper the roles. I prefer to keep everything on the table. I only ask for roles to be whispered to me if people are starting to roll off against each other, because somebody keeps rolling low and they're just like, well, I'm better at that, let me roll. Well, I want to do this, I want to roll too. Well, they rolled low again, I want to roll now. I want to see if I get this. So my uh, way to go about that is uh, very uh, Relics and Rarities, very Deborah Ann Wall style, is what is your modifier? I'm going to roll behind a curtain, and I'll tell you if, you're, if you see anything different. Auto damage roll. So I usually don't have this active because the, uh, the tertiary program that I use, Beyond 20, actually does this all for me, which I much, much prefer. I don't worry about any of these other uh, objects for the most part because I mainly use D&D Beyond. It's easier for me and I think it's going to be a lot easier for you as well. So um, I do not use an honor score. I do not use a sanity score uh, and I save my changes and then after that everything is ready for me. So I go down here to uh, or sorry, after this, yes, I'm done. So I can go to my games, and I can say D&D one-shots. Uh, whoops. That is a totally different thing. Viridium one-shots. Sorry, I'm in a lot of different games. Uh, and I click launch game. I'm going to zoom out, so this is just a little bit easier for uh, me to show everybody. So remember what we did before. Uh, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to pull up our resource uh, tab, which for me is just my detachable hard drive. Uh, for you all, it'll most likely be your download section because you are going to have all of these available to you. Then we just drag them over. Okay. So once you drag these in, you'll notice that you'll have little widgets up here on the left-hand side. Now you as the Dungeon Master are going to have more widgets than your players. Um, you're going to have this one, which allows you to select and pan. Uh, if you want to scroll with your mouse wheel, you absolutely can. Or you can left-click and then click and drag to the left or right or whatever you need to. Uh, the Shapes tool allows you to create, um, or allows you to go to different... Uh, allows you to go to different sections. So you can do one of two things. You can click map and background and then just input things into the map and background, which is the smarter way to go about it, and I rarely ever do that. So now I'm able to import the file. Let me go back and fix this up really quick. So I'm able to import the file, and now that I have that overlay, it's a little bit easier for me to, uh, to make this all work. It looks like my boxes are currently not enough, so what I'm going to do to adjust that is I'm going to go to my page settings. You'll see this blue bar right here that says Page Toolbar. Go to the Page Toolbar, and then at the top you're going to see uh, where you start, or the one page that you have open. There's always one. 
go to that little blue cog wheel. Increase the width. I must not have saved my parameters, and that is totally my fault. Make sure the dynamic lighting is set to off if you have that option. And everything else is how I like it. So, now that I have all those changed, you see that my square got way bigger. I'm gonna squeak that down. It looks like I'm still a little bit off. So, just one more squeak. Still off, one more squeak. That's looking really close. I think I got it. Okay. So now when you have that matched up with your current board, I'm going to import some of my assets that I have from my library. Uh, this is just a little zombie. He's not going to be important or anything like that. But this is how I can tell when somebody is within the right square. You'll notice that they sort of snap into place. That's because they follow these squares of movement. So when they snap into place, it makes it a lot easier. Let's say that this was off a little bit, and you went like that. It's going to snap to the roll 20 squares. It's not going to snap to your scaled squares on your uh, art asset. So, scaling your asset to uh, as close to flush as possible, always a good idea. Um, for this map specifically, since we're going to be doing a ship, let's do everything on the same page. This way, players can actually see where the other players are without having to shift them between pages. However, I will go over how to do that in just a little bit. So, we are still on the background. Map and background. That is what I want to see. Now we are going to import the Silver Bastion crew deck, which is floor number two. All right, we'll set this up fairly close. And since we know the width, all we have to do is pull it down to that exact width, since all of these are gonna be identically sized. And boom, you're done. You place it exactly where you need it to, needed it to be. You can use this white space right here to hide your monster tokens or to hide different tokens for uh, characters you may have. For example, here is Dirt McGurk uh, from our ongoing campaign. I'm going to select him and I'm going to bring him in. And here he is in our assets. So if I wanted to, I can place him here and then when he's on the ship, he's there. Very simple. I'm going to finish this up by putting the lowest deck. Okay. So now that I have the lowest deck on here, let's just size this up properly. Zoom this out. Ta-da! Give that a little bit of space. And perfect. So, now your players can have that sort of overlay, or an underlay. Make it a little bit of fun. And also you can extend it just a little bit in case you want the players to really zoom in. For example, hey fancy man, Night Haze, wonderful to see you guys. All right, so I'm going to zoom this in, and I'm going to show you different ways that you can roleplay while uh, your characters are in different parts of the ship. So I'm going to go to my Asset Manager, which is this one up here, and I'm going to go through my assets. You can load in your assets however you like. Here's some artwork that I have from uh, one of my other games. Uh, well... Sorry, first things first, make sure you're on your Objects and Tokens page. Otherwise, you're going to be making a map and background. So, when you go to your Objects and Tokens page and you grab your assets, your assets are actually going to be uh, placed as a, as a one by one, so a one inch by one inch. 
If you do them in the other uh, versions, they are going to go to the artist scale. So therefore, they are going to be a single square, which makes it much, much easier. All right, so we have our character there. Now let's say that there's going to be a couple of other characters. Why not a kobold or two? So we have a kobold that's going to be staying in this cabin, but maybe there's multiple kobolds. You can simply right click on your character or on your token with this uh, select move button uh, or widget selected, hit copy, and then you can right click and hit paste wherever you want to. For hotkeys, this is very simple. You simply click to where you want it to go and cl uh, press Control V. If you're on a Mac, Command V. So, oh, I just realized I'm out of frame. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so, let's say we have a whole bunch of kobolds right there. Just a family of kobolds that are relaxing. I'll get to that in just a minute. So you can have this one character role play in with just these folks right here. Now this is just the screen that you can see. However, your characters can zoom in on this as well. Or sorry, your player characters can zoom in on this as well so that they are a little bit tighter up. Uh, sometimes having that special artwork uh, does make people feel really, really good, especially if you have people that draw or that make their own art. I highly recommend it. These are the standard stock from D&D uh, &D Beyond. Um, so, let's say, for example, you wanted your player token to have a name. Let's say this person uh, is named Faraz, and I wanted his name to be visible by everybody else. You're going to place him to be controlled by a certain player. Um, once you have your players invited, you'll see all of their names listed here. Bazarkus seems like a perfectly fine person to control this person. I'm going to go to Advanced and see my player permissions. Do you notice that my name says not to see, but I can edit? I want them to see it, so I click on that. Boom! Faraz is now named. Let's say, for example, you wanted to see the other NPC characters be named. Good old Chop Chop. We'll bring him back just for this little show. However, it's not really important that he's controlled by anybody because he's an NPC. So therefore, you can leave this one blank. However, I do want him to see it because maybe he already knows this person. You can also uh, allow the players to see it after they've made a polite introduction. So, after a polite introduction is, name, is made, Faraz now knows Chop Chop. And they are good and fast friends. They can also explore the rest of the ship by simply clicking and dragging their character wherever they need them to be. If they would like to see how far away something is from them, using this widget over here on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see a little circle that appears to have a ruler coming out of one side. Clicking on that, you can click in one direction and then see how many feet away from you any of this stuff is. I grew up in Pathfinder, so my uh, diagonals are a little bit different than everybody else's, but this is rules as written. Oh, hey, Horsenio, I'm so sorry that you got snacked by Streamlabs again. Uh, but you can see how far away something is from there. If you would like to continue on by looking, simply hold down the Shift key, and then you can check and see where something else is. So click, click. And then you sort of leave it up there. So you can move your mouse around wherever you need it to be. Ta-da! Done. You also can still click and drag with your right click in order to get yourself around the map. So now, let's zoom out a little bit. <coughs> let's say that you wanted to keep something hidden from the players. Like me, for example, who is a silly goose and uploaded the wrong file. Uh, so I was trying to hide my mistake. This is the lower deck. And remember, let's just do this really quick. 
get it to the top of your screen so that you're able to get a good leveled midpoint. Drag it down because it's the exact same size as the others, and boom, you have a perfectly meshed map. So, let's say that you're going to be doing something that you want to hide from the other players. Let's say that they haven't explored this ship at all. You can do, uh, go to this widget over here that looks like a cloud. And you're going to hit uh, any of these buttons here. Click and drag. Enable Fog of War. Yes, I want it. Turn on Fog of War. I do not want the Advanced Fog of War right now as I have not set up any walls. I turn on the Fog of War and I see a little bit of a change in the opacity. That is not a problem. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start revealing different areas of the map by clicking and, draw and dragging. This is the top deck, so the players should be able to see everything that is on the top deck. Not a problem. Just click, drag, and make it available for them. But, they probably wouldn't be able to see everything that is on this bottom deck, so I'm only going to be revealing the things that are not behind closed doors. And that's a simple click and drag over just what the players are able to see. You can simply do it like this, or you can do it in a polygon drag. Just let me show you. So click, 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 and that is now revealed. Ta-da! Click, click, revealed. Click, 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 click revealed. In order to reveal it, use your right click. This is very helpful if you have a lot of things that are going to create cover for other people to get behind or something like that. So as you're looking through, I highly recommend using these blank white spaces to hide other characters. Let's say, for example, there's some reason that you have a tree blight on this ship. Well, you can have him on the side, you can mess with him, you can change his hit points, you can change his AC, AC is 17. Then you can be like, well, goodness, he's super strong and these characters are really not, not all that bright right now. Maybe I should make this fight a little bit easier. I'll change his uh, AC to 14 to nerf him a little bit. Or maybe these guys are like, wow, these tactics are way too good. I should beef him up. He's 80 hit points now. Whatever you want. Remember, it's a fantasy world. If you say it's real, it's real. So, after you reveal all the areas that your players go and, uh, and visit, now they have a innate desire to see all the fog be removed from that map. So maybe they'll go up and they'll say, it's like, do I see any doors in this hallway? Absolutely you do. You see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight doors in this hallway. Okay, I knock on the one that's closest to me. Okay, knock, knock. A kobold enters the door, or uh, answers the door. Hey, what's up? I'm Chop Chop. Introducing the new NPC as Chop Chop. So... Now you have a brand new opened area that the characters can explore and be curious to and meet, to meet a few NPCs in the meantime. Or let's say it's like, Ah, I'm Chop Chop! I'm gonna kill you! Now it's time to roll for initiative. However, we're gonna get to that a little bit later. So, one of the other uh, things that I like to do is I like to bring out my D&D Beyond. This is the app that I like to use for my character creation and also for my campaigns. As you can see, I have a lot of them. <laughs> so, I'm going to show you a few of my characters. Making a character on D&D Beyond is very, very easy and it's only become easier. <coughs> In my characters, I'm going to create a character And then I'm going to be sent to a character creation wizard. Technology is not being my friend today. But it's still here. We're going to go to standard because, let's face it, paperwork is rough, but paperwork is fun. This character's name 
Chop, chop. Homebrew, critical role, playtest. Yes, yes, yes. Why not? Uh, advancement type. So if you are going to be playing in my campaign, we're going to be using XP. I, in my home games, I like to use Milestone because it's a lot easier for me. And it's also because my home games are usually with a lot of people. And not everybody can make it. So it does make somebody feel bad sometimes when they can't make it and it's a no fault of their own. I've always believed that family, love, uh, work, and health always come first. If you have any of those reasons and you can't make it, you should not be, you should not be punished for that. It's just a game. Your hit point type, I prefer manual so that we can roll for hit points, but you can take the fixed, which is uh, one above the midpoint of your hit dice, plus your constitution modifier. I used my prerequisites for my feats and multi-class because I believe that some people are not capable of doing everything. However, they should have as much fun as possible. Uh, Shields level s scaled spells, absolutely, so that other people can see that these spells can get much better as they uh, continue in their adventure. Bards, sorcerers, artificers, and wizards specifically for this because they have to invest a lot into their spells. Um, and Warlocks, way more than that. I ignore the coin weight because it feels good when you have a lot of money. I've never known what that feels like, but I hope that one day I do. Uh, the modifiers, doesn't matter. The character privacy, also doesn't matter. Um, if you don't want anybody else to see your character because it's a very personal thing to you, I recommend doing private. Otherwise, this is a fun game, and you're going to be role-playing a, a avatar of something you've always wanted to do, or, or someone you've always wanted to try and be, either for fun, for chaos, or because this is something that you're working through. So, try public. Now you pick a race. I have a lot of races unlocked. I also have a couple of them that we've made, such as the Lepan. <laughs> so nothing is off the table. Some of them even have uh, sub-races, such as a Dragonborn. Maybe you have a different ancestry. Uh, so you have a black uh, or a bronze. Maybe you're chromatic or maybe you're a metallic. Or in my campaigns, maybe you're a gem dragon. Who knows? So once you pick your character uh, race, let's go tiefling. Let's try the Mistopheles Tiefling. Sure. Then it's going to show me all these different things that it has. After you take a look at all those things, uh, your characters can go through and they can find a class that they want to play. Let's say Druid, for example. Druids are always fun. You'll notice that they have uh, Manage HP at the top. There's a reason for that. So, your rolled HP should always be the maximum of your first level. So, a druid is 1d8, so it is 8. Proficiencies, very simple. Just pop whatever proficiencies that you want down. And then your generation method. One thing as a DM you need to be able to uh, establish with your players, which should be a discussion, is how you're going to generate your stats. For me, in my games, I use a dice bot. You roll six, uh, you roll 4d6 six times, and you keep the highest three of each uh, of those rolls. Um, after that, those are, your uh, those are your character stats. And that is called manual. So this way, you can pop in those stats. Let's say I rolled a 12, 13, a 10, a 6, a th not a 3, an 8 and an 18. And that's what I got. So I could have a really powerful character here. And I know what I'm doing. Uh, I know that I put uh, that all into some odd uh, stat choices. Not a problem. It just happens. Also, Night Haze... I did read that, and I have to come and see some of your 
uh, some of your Sims characters. It's making me super happy to uh, see that somebody's doing this. Uh, your backgrounds are really simple, so some of them actually give you a little bit of bonuses. For example, if you're a sailor, you have uh, proficiencies in athletics and perceptions, and perception, and you are able to uh, to sail boats. Your character's details, sometimes they don't matter, sometimes they do. So your alignment, there actually are positives and negatives to being a specific alignment. Specifically from protection from good and evil spells. If you are a character that is going to be attacking an evil creature, sometimes being a good creature gives you bonus damage. And sometimes being an evil creature, attacking a good creature gives you bonus damage as well. So think about that as you're moving forward. Now here's where you can choose to be a little bit on the giving side or forgiving side. You can tell them to just go through their equipment, which makes it very, very simple. They get a, sh they get a shield, they get a weapon, they can choose uh, their simple stuff, and then not a problem. Done. They are all finished. Or you can tell them that they're going to get a certain amount of gold, which allows them to purchase things. If they're going to purchase things, they can go to add items. And you don't want them to have any magical items just yet. Common items is also uh, a very gray area because there are common items that also allow for magical things. Um, if you happen to catch any of my streams, you notice that the Tangling Grenade is a common item. It's crazy overpowered. It uh, makes the characters roll a 15 check in order to not be tangled by it, and a 20 check if they are tangled by it to bust out. Way strong. Way, way strong. But you'll notice that if you just have proficient and... Uh, or just have proficiency... You'll see that Acid cost 25 gold, so they can add something to that. And if they want to get some armor, well, they can get something like that, which is a gleaming breastplate that just never gets dirty. Some of these things sound really uh, magical and uh, sort of really above your head. They don't do anything. Like, Armor of Gleaming, it just, it just never gets dirty. That's it. It's not going to break a game. It's not going to do anything crazy. It's just... It just never gets dirty. It's not a big deal. And now I'm going to go to the viewing of the character sheet. So, Chop Chop is all completed as a Mistopheles Tiefling Druid. He is level 1. Uh, I'm going to check his equipment, and I'm going to equip everything that we currently gave him. A scimitar and a shield. Now notice that when I put, this, put the leather uh, armor on him, his armor class, which is up here, changes. See? And if I take the shield off, his armor class changes again. This does all of the math for you, which makes it so much easier. Uh, you'll notice that because I have this equipped, uh, because I ticked off that little box next to Scimitar, it's now in his actions tab. So you can see all of the actions that you're able to do within a, within a fight to make it a lot easier on uh, your players to say, what can I do? What, what is this? How can I make this work? Is this a thing? Um, all they have to do is like, oh, I have these actions. Okay, I'll just do this one thing. And then I click this button. So I know that you heard a little whoop in... Uh, in the audio, and I'm going to show you what that did. Let's see? No, of course you don't. What do you see now? What that did is it actually sent the roll in through the virtual tabletop from D&D Beyond. So this way, they don't have to do any math whatsoever. All they have to do is say, I want to attack. Okay, what do you want to attack with? My sword. Ta-da! That's it. And let me show you how to do this. So what you're going to be doing is you're going to be uh, simply going to Google. 
So go to Google and type in Beyond 20. When you go up, you're going to see Beyond 20. Don't worry about that. Uh, you're going to see Beyond 20, Google Chrome. Simply give it a click. And it's an extension. So this is a Google Chrome extension. There's uh, one for Firefox as well. You simply just use whatever extension uh, to whatever browser that you're currently using. Um, right here we'll say add to Chrome or add to Firefox. Once it's done, you'll see up here in the right hand corner will be a D20, a red D20, that has a, uh, the letter B inside of it. And that's beyond 20. So, once you have that up there, simply give it a click and you can check your options. Do you want to whisper the roles to the DM? Never whisper. This way, um, all, of the, all of the roles that you send are going to be uh, available for everybody. So it's not going to be just a game where the DM is altruistic. Uh, everybody sees what everybody rolls and makes it a lot easier on everybody to be like, oh, it's bad luck, doggone it. Um, hide the monster and attack name. I do this because I always think that it's a good idea for the players to be like, hmm, I don't know what attacks he has and I don't know what weapons he has. And also it gives you a lot of opportunity as the dungeon master or as the game master to be able to tweak things, make them stronger, make them better, make them uh, very, uh, make them different, uh, make them more nerfed so it doesn't kill your players right away. Uh, advantage and disadvantage, just do a normal roll. If you would like to use D&D Beyond's digital dice, simply click that and no problem. Uh, auto roll damage and crit? Yes. So you should always roll the damage and crit. It makes things a lot easier for when you send it. So for mine, I always do uh, I always do perfect rolls, which is when you roll for a critical hit, uh, it sh should double the dice. Force all attacks as critical hits. This is only if you're going to be doing something really mean to your players, uh, and I don't recommend you using this feature. You could. I don't recommend it. Uh, update the VTT token hit points? You can. Uh, you don't have to. Display condition updates to the uh, virtual tabletop? That's always a good idea. And I recommend it for players uh, when they're using their character sheets. Um, here's the big thing, which is why I told you that you should uh, have that specific character sheet. This is the one that it's going to be looking for. Therefore, it's going to be translating your virtual tabletop into something that the VTT can read. Therefore, you should always have that listed as your uh, character sheet on roll 20. So keep the rest of these on because they are very important for your, uh, they're very important for when you need to ask a player to roll a to roll an attack or to roll an ability check. Uh, that just makes everything so much easier for you. Um, you should always display all components because if it's a verbal, somatic, or material, um, there may be something that happened with a player that they're not able to do it. Maybe they're, maybe they're paralyzed and they're trying to use something that has a somatic component. They're not gonna be able to move their hands around if they're paralyzed. Uh, maybe somebody, uh, has had their throat punched or something like that and they have a verbal component or maybe their voice has been stolen and they have a verbal component it won't work so you just need to know these are bonuses that I've seen before and I've used these as well uh, also 
if you haven't already, these guys are phenomenal. So if you can uh, help them, you should absolutely should. So I'm going to shrink this just a little bit to make it easier for me to work with. <clears throat> and I'm going to go back to the one shot. So that's the setup. That's everything that you need. One thing that you can do is you can also set up an encounter. This says it's in beta, but it works really, really well for me. So go to the encounter builder, and as that loads, you can choose the characters that you are going to uh, have for your encounter. If you're throwing a level one game, I highly recommend goblins. They are just challenging enough to hit where the players are going to fail once or twice, and that frustration makes the challenge worth it. I recommend you popping up eight of them for just a decent, uh, just a decent fight. If you're worried about how strong your characters are going to be, or if this fight is going to be way too powerful, just say, I'm going to have five players, and I think, and they're all going to be level one, and how is that going to look? It's like, oh, this is going to be a really deadly encounter. Okay, I'll scale that back a bit. Um, how about if I just have four? It's like, okay, it's going to be tricky, but it's not going to be so bad. Um, let me just tell you that the way that D&D 5th Edition is laid out, it is... The challenge rating is a lie. Uh... Players are going to have some really incredible things that they can do that will just wipe the board almost every time super fast. If you have a Warlock in your party and they fire off a single Eldritch Blast against a Goblin, the Goblin's most likely going to die. So that's one less Goblin. If you have a single Barbarian in your party, you have somebody who has effectively 24 hit points because they're raging. And they're going to hit super hard. If you have a sorcerer in the party and they have the sleep spell, they're probably going to put the entire bit of goblins to sleep. These kind of things are just going to happen. So therefore, I recommend doing six for your first encounter. I think that's very fair. What you can do is you can actually click on the name of the creature, and then you're going to see their stat block pop up. Do you notice right here that there's these red, uh, there's these red things that pop up that are all with a letter B inside? This is the D&D Beyond, our D&D Beyond Beyond 20 extension doing its job. So, let's say I am going to uh, make an attack with a goblin scimitar against a creature. I'm going to click on this button right here. You all just heard a whoop in my ears. And you see a creature with an unknown weapon just attacked for a 13 to hit. And it gives you all the math right there. Uh, let me move this over so it's a little bit easier. You're not on my screen. So do you see? All the math there is done for you. So if anybody says, oh man, but what did I roll? Like, did I roll really bad? It's like, no, you rolled a nine. It's not terrible. And it's 1d6 plus 2 damage. They rolled a 1, so it's a very, very low roll for them. Not too bad. Not too bad at all. So let's, for example, say I want there to be... Uh, I want there to be goblins as my encounter in this campaign. Okay. Goblin. Searching for some goblins... You can go to these assets here, which do cost money for you to get. You can come down and you can find some assets that are for free. Uh, these are the sim at www.dungini.com. And you can import these guys totally free. You can adjust them. So I see that this goblin has 7 hit points in a 15 armor class. The way that I like to organize things is I like to put the hit points in the red. So 7 hit points there. Oop. And a 15 armor class in the blue. 
If I want to make a health bar that goes across them, I'm going to do this. I'm going to double click. And I'm going to put 7 out of 7. Boop. My fault. That is not the right way to do that. I'm going to go to this. 7. Where's the red? There it is. 7 out of 7. Now as I zoom in even closer, do you see the little red bar that's a, above his head? It gives him a health bar. So this way, I know exactly how much health he has. Uh, this is beneficial for me. The other players may not be able to see this. If I want them to see this, which I think is cheating just a little bit, because uh, characters shouldn't know the total hit points of a creature. They should be able to guess and keep it in their minds. So, I'm going to have six of them. Remember, all I did was a control C and then control V or command V if you are on a Mac. And they're going to stow away in the front of the ship. So, I'm going to zoom that out. Nice. Okay. So now, here comes the part about what if they discover them? What if they find these characters? And what if they, like, smell them or hear them rustling? Or one of them peeks their head out of the hole that they made in the side of the ship? It's like, okay. Now it's time for initiative. You'll see this really big clock over here, and that's the turn order. There's no tokens on the page that can take a turn. So there's two ways I can do this. I can use D&D Beyond's uh, direct feature by going to the page. You'll see Roll Initiative, and you'll see the red B that's next to it. I click that, and I rolled a 12. Ta-da! That one character now has rolled initiative. But watch what happens if I have no characters clicked. I go back and I click Roll Initiative for a Goblin. You wanted to send the return uh, this result to the turn tracker, but no valent token was selected. So, because I didn't click on one of my tokens first, it didn't know exactly whose initiative that was, so it just didn't send. So make sure that you click on a character first using your select widget. Going to Goblin, click Roll Initiative. Ta-da! There he is. So after you go back and forth and get initiative rolls for all of your goblins, Do, 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 do. You'll notice that all of these initiative rolls are out of order. Uh, the highest roll should be going first. So you go to this, and then you sort numerically by descending. Now you notice the one who rolled 21 is going to go first. The one who rolled 14, those two are going to go next. 13, 12, 5, and that's all six of your goblins. Now, let's say that Faraz here is the one who discovered them. Now it's Faraz's turn. Faraz, however, uh, made a mistake. He's like, oh, shoot, I'm so sorry. I rolled a d20, but I didn't click on my token, and it didn't send to the chat. Not a problem. You're the game master, so make it easier on them. Simply right-click on their character token, select Add Turn, and they're going to have just a zero modifier on the bottom. Click on that and add what they rolled. After that, sort by descending again. So now they're ready for combat. That's all the hard or that's all the hard stuff. So after that, they're going to be taking turns back and forth when you get characters that have a chance to move, you move them up next to them and then you 
Swing a big attack with your scimitar. Critical hit. Oh, Faraz is only a level one character. He's down. Bland. Starting his death saving throws. See what I mean? Level one characters. They're squishy. So, to make things a little bit easier on you, I, have gi I am going to be giving you a complete one page about everything that you need to know about this, uh, this game. So, what you should know, the Eritrea, which is the ship that you're currently on, is headed south. It left from port one day ago. It is a five-day trip to your next destination. Uh, it is a merchant vessel and it transports uh, trade goods and passengers. Controlled by House Raxbillow. I'm gonna zoom out so that you can see uh, each little bit of this. Give me just a moment. Doo -doo -doo -doo. So you can see the whole ship and try to get an idea of where you would want your uh, monsters or characters or NPCs to be. Um, it is con this ship is controlled by House Raxbillow. Remember, Raxbillow. In Craywald, in the country of Orthrondon. They have a fleet of 200 ships. The Eritrea is what is known as a galley ship. So it has got a single mast, and it has two jibbed sails that come out and the jibs are the long uh, long vertical sails that are on long vertical poles that extend if your characters are curious about how long the ship is or how wide the ship is just tell them to zoom out grab their measuring tool and they can do the measurement themselves it's 140 feet long and it's 30, 30 feet wide Um, there is a crew of 15 on board the ship. You do not need to co create names, backstories, and all that jazz for everybody. Uh, there are just 15 people that are on the ship that are just the crew. Uh, they all respect Captain Graves. So Captain Graves is the character that I'm going to be giving you so that you don't have to worry about creating a, a captain's character. Um, Mutiny will get you thrown in the brig. Any talks about m mutiny will get you thrown in the brig. Uh, harming any member of the ship is going to get you beat up or worse. Uh, and doing both at the same time will get you killed. Captain Graves is a great delegator. He's a great listener. Mirror is the ship's temporary doctor. She is currently on board the ship because their old doctor is uh, sick and needed to stay in the last port. Uh... Mirror is a Warforged, and unfortunately the Sea Spray is not great for her joints. So that is denoted why she has a very, very low strength score and a very, very low dexterity score. But she's very intelligent and also very wise. Uh, a Warforged is a robot person, so most of her body is metallic. Uh, Martin is the first mate, and he's a Jolly Giant. Uh, Everyone on board used to be pirates about 20 years ago, but since uh, Guihan Raxbillow, who is the commander of the old Raxbillow pirates, uh, he decided to go straight ever since he found love with Ileana, his wife who, used, who still owns the Broken Bone uh, in Craywald. So here are the things that should happen in a one-shot. It's very, very simple for you to uh, over... It's very, very easy for you to want to over-prepare so that if they walk into a room, there's so much stuff for them to look through and a bunch of lore. That's wonderful. I highly recommend that you do those kind of things for dungeon crawls and for like ancient ruins and things like that because those are things that people are going to want to search top to bottom. For these... Maybe not so much. This is more just a means to an end and a means for transport. It's a good way to get everybody's feet wet. Um, the players should meet at least three people on board the ship. Either they meet them themselves, or you have them come up and approach them and introduce themselves. 
have Captain Graves come up and introduce uh, himself. He's a captain. He probably has to make other people feel like they're uh, wanted and in in good excuse me and in good hands. Uh, maybe the cook is a very Hell's Kitchen Gordon Ramsay kind of guy, and he's just screaming all the time. Uh, maybe. Martin is just looking for people to pass the time with, and you guys wind up playing a game of uh, of three-card ante or Texas Hold'em at the table and have some fun with that. Who knows? Um, the adventurers are usually heavily armed, and that's just when you start the game. You're going to have weapons. You're going to have armor. Most people don't. Most people don't have, you know, huge swords on their backs or are in chainmail armor during the daytime. They're just in clothes and just doing their job. So maybe that's a way for people to approach them. It's like, oh, you must be an adventurer. Or you're a guard, or you are some kind of uh, interesting person. Who knows? Um, then you should try to establish a conflict. Uh, one of the conflicts I highly recommend is there is a thief on board. People are starting to notice that their items are coming up missing or they're noticing that their rooms have been rummaged through. They're noticing that their food has been missing. They're noticing that the supplies are running dangerously low or that uh, the water is becoming tainted and it's up to our cleric to uh, create water for the rest of us to drink. So those kind of things. Um, you could also create conflict between the NPCs and also drag the players into it. Um, classist jerks that are on board, such as nobles that don't want to be near the riffraff or something like that. Or you can have uh, different sailors that are just like, no, you you found that woman on before I did. And it's like, no, I didn't. She was, she was looking at me. And then get into a big fist fight just because they have nothing better to do, so they just need to fight that day. Um... There is going to be a treasure that is going to be guarded by a single guard on the very bottom deck. Uh, the treasure, I am going to ping uh, exactly where it is. So right here is going to be a magic item called a Bulgine Globe. A Bulgine Globe is a magic item that I have created based on uh, a magical form of something that if you would like to do any more research on, I will be happy to enlighten those uh, once I finish an actual campaign setting. Uh, which may or may not happen soon. But a bull giant globe is currently being transported and protected. The guard that's protecting it, we're going to use Faraz as an, example, as an example right now. He's all, bar he's all bark and no bite. He is a... He's a telephone tough guy. He will shout up and down that he's going to beat you up, that he's stronger than you, that, uh, that you'll be sorry if you cross him. But the moment that you show your teeth and the moment he's just like, yeah, okay, let's fight then. He's like, okay, I didn't mean it. I didn't mean it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. He'll, he'll, he'll back down immediately. And I think the player's finding a different, re a different thing to do other than I have a knife so I should stab something in order to make this uh, continue. You don't need that. You don't. Uh, let's give players another way to solve a problem. Uh, the mystery of the Bull Giant Globe should still remain a mystery. But if the players roll a super high, uh, super high investigation check or a super high Arcana check, or if they have the Identify spell, go ahead and give it to them. Uh, the ongoing conflict, which should remain a mystery until the players uh, actively investigate it, either being contracted to investigate it by the ship's captain, being asked to investigate it by the ship's, uh, by the ship's passengers, or by becoming involved in an altercation between the ship's crew, so you're trying to clear someone's name. Um... There are going to be stowaways in this forward compartment on the bottom floor. For those players who are very clever, um, 
they will be able to tell that there is a forward compartment in the ship, but there's a flat wall. Or maybe they can smell something. Or maybe they're left a trail of uh, muddy footprints. Or uh, somebody had killed a sheep and there's a trail of blood. Then, of course, the players could completely have no idea what's going on. So the next day goes and just make it worse. Uh, the food is about to run out. And it doesn't make any sense why we're about to run out of food. We have more than f enough food for double this trip. Um, somebody said that there was smoke some coming from somewhere. And that's very bad because we're transporting a lot of smoke powder. Uh, smoke powder, also gunpowder. So these are things that you can add in to make it uh, a little bit more like, okay, we need to search this out, otherwise we may die. Or we may be in a lot of trouble. Um, but then again, players are chaotic, and sometimes they just won't go for the things that make... Uh, they just won't go for the things that you put out in front of them, and sometimes you just need to force it on them. So if by the second day they just don't get it, or they just don't want to do it, have the goblins come up and start attacking people out in the open. You know? Make it fun. Um, the other sailors can secure the other decks and make sure that the passengers are safe. This way it's not going to be how many of the uh, sailors and can I get the captain down here to fight them and just we just watch and collect experience points. It's like, no, we'll... T the rest of them have to steer the ship. You know, the rest of them have to make sure the passengers are safe. So we'll secure this area. You go down and take care of that. Uh, and you can come up with any reason for that. Maybe the goblins started a fire. And you know that fire on a ship is almost instantly the worst thing that could happen next to a massive hole in the ship. Um... And honestly, if uh, at the end of that encounter they route the troublemakers instead of just killing them all, or they surrender, um, reward that too, saying like, "That's awesome. Yeah, they're gonna be they're gonna be put into a, j uh, a jail, or they're gonna be thrown into the brig. Uh, the brig, by the way, is right here. It's on the bottom floor. Uh, there's gonna be nobody." Um, uh, there's going to be nobody in the bridge, uh, or sorry, in the brig. But don't let that uh, stop you from trying to place your players inside. Uh, sometimes that just has to happen that way. <sighs> sorry. Oh, I need myself another bit of caffeine. When the players do finish with the encounter, reward them for uh, what they have done. If they spent more time talking with the passengers then have the passengers reward them. If they spent more time talking with the crew, have the captain reward them. If they spent a lot of time being troublemakers, maybe they find something on the goblins and they just don't tell anybody. You know? So they always should get rewarded by something, either by you or by the NPCs. Um, I would recommend that you uh, start with the number 10 multiplied by their overall average character level. So if you start with a level 1 campaign, it's 10 times 1, which is 10. If they start with a level 3 game, then it's 10 times 3, which is 30. Uh, level 5, yada, yada, yada. Um, and that's each person's reward in gold. And then give them a single healing potion. Just all of them together, one single healing potion. Uh, that single healing potion is going to go a long way in their minds because it's like, oh, I don't, I don't die then. This is going to be great. So, all of everything that I just mentioned is in this one pager. Uh, it's going to be very simple. You can literally have this thing printed out right in front of you, and it just guides you through everything that you need, everything that is uh, to make your adventure super easy. Uh, these things should happen. They don't have to happen. Like, maybe somebody just runs directly down into the basement, and I'm just like, yeah, I'm going to live in this hole that's in the front of the ship, and then goblins. 
this adventure, if you run it, can last anywhere between an hour and a half to four hours. It all depends on how the characters want to play. The combat, especially if you have a lot of players, could last anywhere between one to two hours. Um, if you have newer players, it's going to last a little bit longer. So, uh, I highly recommend that uh, you use this adventure, if this is your very first one-shot, like a session zero, to see if everybody meshes well, and if everybody likes your DMing style, to establish roots as uh, this is now the adventuring party, and to hook the rest of the party for the next step in an adventure. Uh, here are just a couple hooks that I threw out there. Um, the captain is really impressed with you, and they give you a writ of passage to House Raxbillow, or any other noble house, uh, on his behalf. Uh, Martin is super glad that he can go see his daughter now in Craywald, and he wants you to join him at his house uh, for supper as soon as you can. And Mira is going to be heading to the temple to assist with the deciphering of a relic, which is the whole reason that she went on this trip in, in the first place. So these are all things that you could uh, hook the players into continuing this game and this ongoing thing. And hopefully they're going to really enjoy it. Hopefully they have a really fun time. I've noticed that characters and, uh, excuse me, that players, for the very first maybe 30 minutes, they're not going to talk very much. So the best thing for you to do is you start up with an understanding of, it's like, okay, so you get on board the ship, the Eritrea. Uh, you describe the scenery that's around them. If you want it to be rainy, tell them that it's a rainy day, rainy night cloudy, overcast, the smell of uh, sea spray is thick in your nose. You've left the port uh, that you've come from about a day ago. Um, you're just now getting your bearings and just now getting your sea legs. As you come out, you see a few of the crew on top of the ship that are... Uh, you see a few of the crew on top of the ship that are all chatting and having fun. Uh... You see the bosun telling everybody where to go and what ropes to tie down. Uh, it is a very gentle or very turbulent night or very turbulent day. Who knows? Uh, it's whatever you decide to choose. The sails are billowing with the, with the winds of adventure. Go cheesy. Players love cheesy. And if they don't, make them love it because it's that much more fun. Uh, as the as you all are starting to see more and more of your ilk, you're starting to see uh, others who are uh, armed as well, and others who are wearing adventuring packs, and others who came on with the same promise that you did, that you're looking for uh, your fortune and brighter pastures elsewhere. Uh, as you explore the ship, you can see the captain's quarters down south. You notice a uh, very tall tabaxi man uh, with a calico fur manning the helm. This is Captain Graves, as he introduced himself to you as you got on board. Captain Graves is a uh, long-standing member of the Raxbillow fleet. This is his ship, the Eritrea. His first mate, Martin, a massive jolly man, uh, is sitting beside, looping and knotting more ropes, uh, and checking the rigging and making sure that everybody is doing exactly what they need to be doing where they need to be doing it. Uh, you notice that there is a few people playing the accordion or playing bagpipes. Ugh. It even hurts for me to say it. Or playing something uh, on top of the ship. That is a lovely jaunt. Some of you may even recognize it from your hometowns. Uh, you notice that there were probably about 10 or 15 passengers that came on with you. You know that there's about 15 crew members that work on this ship. Uh, you've, e you've eaten with them. You've uh, chatted with them. You've learned some of their stories. And now we begin with your story. As you all are uh, all on top, nothing but ocean as far as the eye can see, uh, you start hearing 
some chatter from the about food coming up missing. Some people will feel like they're missing a few uh, items from their luggage that they carried on. There's nobody that seems to know exactly uh, what is happening because nobody's come to clean cabins. And this is not that kind of a ship. So they think that somebody might be pilfering their stuff um, with that. Uh, this is when I would make everybody roll for their first perception check. To say, you know, I've been noticing that. And if they roll high enough, I think I was hearing the sound of tiny feet outside of my cabin one night. And I remember that happening. I might have some information. And you can guide them by saying, uh, by sort of implanting ideas. By saying, you know, I think I did hear that. I think I have information. I feel like I should tell them about that. So, player, would you like to go up and tell them that you may have seen something like that? And that will sort of break that wall to say, okay, yes, I will go over and say that because that would be helpful for us to know. And it would continue on the story. So as they come up to the NPC, you don't have to do a silly accent. Not everybody's a great voice actor. You can simply be just like, yes, I am that person. Uh, you can do it in your, in, your, in your body. You can change your, your face around a little bit. One thing I like to do is I position my lips in different places. So if I'm an old person, I wrap my lips around my teeth. And I just talk to people like this. This is exactly how I was talking to before. It's just, it helps. If you want to try to sound like a whiny kid, just pinch one nostril. It helps out a lot, actually. And remember, you're just trying to get that immersion. So something that's slightly different is actually going to pull the uh, pull the players in. If you can do an accent, go for it. If your accents suck, go for it even harder. Just because your accents aren't perfect Welsh or aren't perfect Scottish from the Glasgow region, you'll be fine. Uh, it's just mattering that you're putting in the effort. And most players are able to see that. So don't have that kind of fear. Um, as you're looking or as you're guiding the characters through these character interactions, there's going to be a lot of times when you can point out some different interesting things. You can say, I see a few of the uh, more common passengers in the front and they all have uh, casting lines out. You can also see them way back above near uh, where the helm is and they have casting lines out as well. It looks like they're trying to do some boat fishing. Maybe you should join them. Have like a roll off and do a bunch of strength checks to see if they're going to catch a major fish. And maybe they'll be heroes for the day because they caught a swordfish at sea. So it's like, yeah, you caught one. All right, you're, you're reeling the thing in. You're pulling it as hard as you can. Roll a strength check. And if they get above a 12, let them get a little bit of progress and have them roll three times. And if they succeed three times, they get it. If they fail, they lose the, they lose the fishing rod or the fish gets away. Um, anything like that. So you can make a lot of little like mini games here and there for other people to get. And then... They get either fame, notoriety, maybe some gold, maybe a little bit of money. Maybe they find a cool thing. Maybe somebody gives them a little trinket. Uh, maybe somebody on board has a pet. Uh, a lot of role players will definitely be those kind of people who will admit, the moment I'm invited to a party, I look for the dog or I look for the cat. And I'm going to pet that dog or pet that cat. Let them. Uh, make a dog. Find a dog that you can just place into the into the campaign. That's definitely something that you can do. Uh, you want a dog? Sure. There you go. There's a dog on the second floor. <laughs> uh, his name is Boosh. He is unamused. He is unamused Boosh. Uh, but, yeah, just let them have fun. Uh, if they say, it's just like, I'm going to go search for a puppy. Okay, roll a perception check to see if you find a puppy. If they roll above a certain number, it's like, yeah, just give them a puppy. 
It's the worst that could happen. Um, and let them have let them have their fun with it. Uh, for each one of these rooms, you can pretty much fill them with whatever you want. Uh, the captain's quarters is going to have the coffer. So if they're going to try to do something a little bit evil and try to steal from the captain, they could do that. Uh, it's going to be hard to get underneath his nose. He is a level 12 fighter. And he also has 15 people working for him. So if they come up with a really crazy heist plan, go for it. Maybe that's going to be your one shot. Is you want to just make him a really crazy heist. Sure, why not? The crew mostly sleeps in the front here. So, at night, uh, they sleep in shifts, uh, 12 hours on, 12 hours off. Um, and there's a night crew and a day crew. Uh, same amount of people per crew. The only person who has overlap is the first mate. So, um, half the crew will sleep in these hammocks and in the front. Uh, or No, I'm sorry. Half the crew will sleep in these hammocks for the first night. Or, or for the first shift, and then they will get up, and then the other crew will sleep in those uh, same hammocks at the end of that night. So there's always crew sleeping in there. Uh, these can be filled with whatever characters your heart desires, any of them whatsoever. If you want them to be all fairies, if you want them to be all human, elves, dwarves, uh, vampires, go for it. Uh, whatever makes uh, you the happiest, then absolutely. Um... I would recommend that you have, uh, if this is your first time DMing, make it mostly humans. It's easy. Um, you can have a couple nobles, some common people, a few craftsmen. Uh, just make it simple. Whatever is easiest for you to keep uh, track of. So if you want to try to branch out and throw in some kobolds, go for it. If you just want to have humans, Go for that, too. Pop in whatever human token you want, and boom, done. Uh, I'm going to go back and read my chat for just a second. Cleaning, I'm going to... Night Haze married a pirate? Huh. Okay. I can believe that. <clears throat> All right. So, as you're going through, um, make the major magic mystery the Bulljine Globe. Uh, the link to the Bulljine Globe will be provided, and the page to the Bulljine Globe will be copied and pasted and sent to, uh, sent to my Discord. In order to get all the assets to this, I would like for you to join my Discord which I'm placing into the chat right now. And also, if you are uh, watching this on VOD, uh, you can simply go to my About page, look in Discord, and eventually you're going to see free resources. I'm going to put this all, uh, both as individual uh, uploads and as one package upload. So this way you can simply take it, print out everything, and just play right away. Oh, backstories of NPCs, got it. Nice, nice, nice. So as the players continue to explore the ship, make each interaction not always pleasant. Um, don't make every character that you uh, are going to introduce a complete <laughs> but if you are going to introduce a bunch of characters that are uh, sour, sour. That's fine. Not every character is going to want to talk to a heavily armed person. Uh, make those conversations fruitful, though. Give them a little bit of lore. Give them a little bit of a story. This is like, what's your story? And then take a story from your daily life and just change the names around a little bit. Like, oh, I was just, I was drinking last night and somebody had, oh, they just really offended me and I feel... Uh, I just feel angry right now, so I'm cooling off, or something like that. Um, I don't know, I've been listening to a lot of Real Housewives as I'm doing a lot of my writing. Uh, my fiancé has been having that on, so it's just constant, YOU JUDGE ME! YOU JUDGE, judge ME! Blah! It sounds a lot like that, too. 
Um, as you uh, guide the players through, let them know that there's still an, a looming threat. If you have anybody that has advantage on smell checks, like Loxodon, or if you have anybody that uh, has a pet, like a ranger beastmaster that has a animal companion, it's like, make them always want to go down towards where the fight is actually going to be. This way there's a... Uh... <laughs> Uh, this way, there's going to be like a, a solid push towards the encounter. After maybe your two-hour mark, which I believe is a, a good solid point for, okay, let's pull back on the roleplay. Now it's time to finish up some conflict. Um, go ahead and find a way to engage the players in the encounter. From the encounter, simply have them roll initiative the way that we did before. Um, once they roll initiative, follow the combat rules you're going to notice that every time you hover your uh, cursor over one of their numbers, a yellow box is going to appear. This way you always know who's alive, who's not. Um, also, one thing I should bring up too is your players may or may not know exactly what they can do in combat. Uh, with this package, I'm going to have a one page for your players, which is a PDF that tells you... Uh, you have a movement action, which means you can move up to your speed. You have an action action, which allows you to do something that is listed under the all of those actions that you can do. Or a bonus action. And bonus actions can be uh, very specific to your race, class, uh, abilities, um, your subclass, whatever that may be. So that's sort of a specialized thing. But this one page is going to make it very, very easy for your players to understand. It's like, okay, this is what I can do on my turn. Also, one thing that I've noticed is that players will often not think about what they're going to do until it's their turn. And then they'll just begin reading from the very top all of the stuff that they can do. This is a real big time suck. So one thing that you can ask your players to do is, hey, I'm about to get you on a... Uh, or sorry... Um, it's like, this is combat. So in the initiative order, if you can see this, know that when your turn is about to come up, I'm going to ask you what you want to do. You have a movement action, or sorry, you have mo movement, an action, and a bonus action. So think about how you want to spend those. Uh, and then one way that you can go about it is when I'm on this character's turn, I know that my next, per uh, the next character is going to be a player character. So I'll say, okay, and it's now this guy's turn. Faraz, you're on deck. Or Faraz, you're going to be up next. Think about what you're going to do. This gives them, it's like, oh, I'm back in the world now. Okay, i got to figure out what I'm going to be doing. And you're sort of snapping it out of it. Um, it does help. It's not a panacea. It doesn't cure everything. For the most part, if you get people that are so engaged in the fight that they have to, like, oh, crap, um, I was not paying attention at all and they have to jump back in, that's good. That means you're doing good. Uh, you may want to make this go faster, and that's one way that you can do it, is just breaking them out of it just before their turn is about to happen. And then they can go ahead and uh, throw out what they're planning on doing. This may not work, all right? And that's okay. So if you have those players that are like, oh, crap, it's my turn. Uh, yeah, can you just tell me everything that just happened? It's like, no. Saying no kind of will get you on the bad side of some of your players, but uh, sometimes you gotta let them know. It's like you gotta you gotta pay attention. Like you gotta pay attention to that. You can see where all the where all the players are. Um, none of your friends are down yet, and uh, some of the monsters are hurt. So this way they'll continue moving, but you can expect them to pay at least a little bit of attention. Uh, and if they were just like, hey, what just happened in, like, the last five minutes? I wasn't paying attention. He's like, well, you see where the characters are. It's now your turn. What do you want to do? Um, but if they're like, hey, I'm really sorry. I had to go and feed my kid. Um, they, were, uh, they were crying, and it was bottle time, and I totally miss it. And it's like, oh, that's totally fine. Yeah, let me go back. So they attack. They attack. What did you do, bud? You attacked? Okay. Uh, this one defended. Uh, this one cast a spell. 
that's not a problem. Remember, health, love, family, and uh, work always come first. So um, use that to sort of keep the pace of the game moving along. After they finish, uh, you have six dead bodies that are there. Okay, what are you going to do with them? Most likely throw them overboard. It's a ship. You're at sea. Um, but let's say, for example, that uh, you are playing not with a bunch of level one characters. Let's say you're playing with even stronger characters. Uh, let's say you were playing with a bunch of level threes. One of my favorite monsters to bring out towards uh, other players is the doppelganger. Because then it's sort of a cerebral fight. Then it's like, oh crap, they're not really that one NPC. They were a doppelganger the whole time. Oh no. Uh, when whenever they decide to reveal themselves, fine. A doppelganger has around, uh, around 50 HP. I don't exactly remember. And their armor class is pretty up there. I believe it's 14. So... That's still a good fight, especially for a bunch of level 3 players. I would recommend putting maybe three of those uh, doppelgangers out. And let's say that they have a bigger goal. Maybe their goal is not to eat food and to uh, steal junk trinkets, but to get to the bull giant globe. Maybe that's what they were trying to do the entire time. Uh, and that's perfectly fine. Or let's say that there was something even bigger than that and you had a bunch of level 5 players. Uh, let's say that instead you were uh, werewolves. Because now you have the concern of curses and lycanthropy. And werewolves are super hardy. They can take a lot of hits but they don't hit very well. So your characters may actually have a better chance of surviving that encounter than most others. Uh, werewolves are not... Um, werewolves uh, will curse the uh, player if they fail a constitution saving throw. It's not immediate. Uh, so they can get a remove curse from uh, Mirror, the healer. That is possible. <laughs> or they can just go for it and you have a lycanthrope as a party member I mean there's probably going to be a bunch of party members that are going to be like wait I can be a I can be a were I can be a were tiger I can be a were bear yeah I want to do that so, okay there you go or if it's even bigger than that make it vampires in every vampire movie I've ever watched, whenever a vampire was being transported over water, people die. It just happens. So, make that a thing. That could be fun. So, all of these assets, uh, aside from the character tokens, the character tokens you can actually download from D&D Beyond. So here's the goblin. All you gotta do is, on this side, Click Save Image As, and you can import those JPEGs or PNGs directly into your Roll20. Um, while I get everything collected and ready, I'm just going to do a quick recap. So, Beyond 20 is the extension for, uh, for Google Chrome and Firefox that allows you to take your D&D uh, Beyond, both monsters and your characters, and to be able to pop those in to, uh, and to be able to pop all their roles into uh, your virtual tabletop. Roll20 is the virtual tabletop that I use, so I was able to give you sort of a crash course on how to get this set up, and how to load up your very first one shot that you can do digitally. Um, if you would like to use the uh, the voice and video on uh, on this website on Roll20, you absolutely can. You just come down here to whatever this is, uh, video and audio chat options. 
whatever your uh, inputs are. So make sure your input is exactly what you want it to be. Uh, make sure your video source is either your laptop video or your webcam or your HDMI cam, whatever that may be. If you want to broadcast to others, you can choose um, uh, video or voice or nothing at all. I personally, every time that I play, I choose nothing because I prefer to have all of my voice and video through Discord. Um, it just works better for me. And those people who have uh, computers that simply can't take the resource strain, um, Google Hangouts is also really good for that. Uh, this is, Roll20 is good. It's not always super reliable in um, keeping its servers 100% at all times. I have had it cut out on me in, uh, during games before. Uh, if you watch my last Thursday campaign session, it did cut out a few times. Sucks, but it happens. Uh, so, I would recommend you doing that. Um, and then just hit reconnect. And that sort of connects everything else. When you get started with this, your name that you signed up for D&D Beyond, or for Roll20 with, is going to appear as your display name. For most people, that is their first name and their last initial. So it's always a good idea if you're changing, uh, the way that I do it, is I will pop in uh, first name, or sorry, character name, so Bizarcus, and then first name. This way, uh, so I'm going to pop it and move this over here so that everybody can see. This is to help me out as a, oops, too much. So this is to help me out as a dungeon master because I'm not going to know everybody's names. <laughs> Uh, when we get started, which is one of the reasons that I mostly use our Discord handles during our Thursday sessions. Um, I recommend that you do this until you know everybody's voice by heart. Uh, or know everybody's, like, demeanor, their cadences, their natural accents by heart. It's always something you can do. Uh, this is just what helped me out the most. And... Uh, I wanted to give you that. Let's say, for example, that you wanted to have the ships, but you only wanted one ship, and you wanted to make a new page. It's very easy. Hit the little blue tab that's right here. Click Create New Page. You can label it as Other Ship, or whatever you want to pop it as. Click, and then you'll go to that page. You get a brand new page, fresh start, whatever you want. Um, I always like to have a page that's like, like this for going back and grabbing character tokens, especially if you have people that uh, switch out every once in a while. I keep all of the character tokens on one page. This way I can just click, drag, put them into a group, and then copy and paste them over onto whatever map I'm going to be using that day. Uh, that helps me out a lot, and I hope it helps you out a lot. You'll notice that there is a little red banner here that says players. I'm going to zoom in again. Oops. It's a little red banner there that says players can be moved from uh, spot to spot. What that does is it allows for players to see whatever that map is going to be. So... I can be on this while the players are looking on my other map right now. So I can be, it's like, okay, Chop Chop is going to be over there. He's going to be jumping down a hole. There's going to be a dog right there. While I'm having a conversation with the players and they're just role playing or exploring stuff. And it's like, uh, sure, roll me an investigation check, please. While I draw a box right there and I don't let anybody else know that I'm doing it. Uh, and then eventually I'll, I'll bring the moment. It's like, yes, and when you get back on the ship, you notice that everything's different. And, of course, they'll be, ooh, ah, you do so good. 
If, for example, you just want one player to look in another map, let's say they have a familiar or something that they can look through, you can simply click on their name, click and drag onto a different page, and you'll notice that their little symbol is going to be right there. Uh, what that does is just that one person is now viewing that page. If you want them to change, you simply grab their notation and drag them back over to player. When you see that little yellow frame around players, drop it, and now they're back with all the rest of the players. Okay. So I believe that's everything. I am going to leave the last five minutes or so open up to an AMA. Uh, is there anything that you all would like to ask regarding this one-shot or anything you would like to have clarified? I am happy to answer whatever you all have. And happy to add anything as well. While you do that, I'm going to show you a little bit of a feature here with Roll20. It's called the Jutebox. With the Jutebox, you can manage the audio. I recommend you going to Tracks, and then searching t for Tabletop Audio. The one that I am using currently is... This is called Underground Lake. So, I'm going to add this to the game. And right here, you're going to see a little loop button. I'm going to click that, make sure that it's listed. And I'm going to turn it down just a little bit because it is pretty loud. And I'm going to start playing it. I'll turn this up in mine just so that you can hear it fairly well. But as you can tell, the same sort of audio that was going through before is now going through uh, everybody else who is currently viewing your campaign. I personally like three specific tracks from Tabletop Audio for combat. I like Cry Havoc. It's a lot of fun. I like Endgame. And I like Skirmish. I also would recommend Quiet Cove, since you are on a ship. Why not? Alright. So, I believe that I am actually going to uh, end the stream here. In about an hour and a half, I have another uh, group I'm going to be DMing for. And I wish you all all the best. Thank you very, very much for watching today. Thank you, uh, those who joined in the chat. And thank you, those who are uh, interested in becoming a one-time dungeon master for your friends or for others. Uh, I will eventually be posting these videos to YouTube for others to uh, watch and enjoy. I'm currently collecting and collating all of them into uh, a bunch of packages and seeing what I can do under the terms of agreements with Twitch. Um, it's a little bit difficult to navigate. Their terms of service is many, many pages. Uh, but in the meantime, I wish you all the best. Uh, please tune in. I'm going to be streaming tomorrow. Tomorrow's going to be a little bit more chill. I'm just going to have some more fun. Uh, Hopefully it'll be something entertaining that you all can have in the background and less educational. Um, Thursday is going to be a brand new Vanguard. If you have not signed up for the Vanguard yet, you can join my Discord. Uh, Discord? Oh, Horace Senio, wonderful for contributing the Trouble Bubbles. Oh, Community Challenge is 25% complete. Very, very nice. Okay, uh, I'll explain the Trouble Bubbles as well. So for everybody who's watching the live streams, they're uh, gathering what is called Trouble Bubbles. Um, these are channel points in Twitch. 
They accrue with a certain rate for those who are subscribers and those who are not subscribers, there's a lower rate. Um, but every 15 minutes you get a treasure chest with 50 points or more. And then you can turn those in to be able to uh, give the ongoing campaign some bonuses. Like, turn in 500 of these channel points and you get uh, 10 gold for the caravan to use whenever they want. Uh, oh my goodness. People are sending in more and more and more. Awesome. Um, you can also give them, like, martial weapons, a bunch of quivers of arrows, uh, a few bolts and crossbows. Uh, you can give them new armor. You can give them alchemical weapons, uh, like uh, alchemist fire or vials of acid. I've also created uh, homebrew items, like booming gel and thundering moss. Um, you could find... Uh, you could also help them with healing potions as well, as community goals. So that's something that our community right now is doing, is, is turning in their uh, turning in their stuff right now for uh, new community goals. And cheers to that. Uh, the party already has a bunch of healing potions. So they are slowly reducing their uh, supply, and our viewers and the rest of the caravan, which I call uh, my community, is uh, slowly building up their supply and slowly building up their stock. You can also turn in uh, food. So for every 10 uh, bits of traveling food, the caravan moves to a new city in the campaign. Right now, they're moving out of the quiet uh, farming village of Belsong, and we're taking votes on where to move next. It's either uh, Sildreville, which is a uh, it's an elven glade, um, to Sail Point, which is a fishing uh, town, to Three Rings, which is a merchant's town, or to the Platinus Front Lines, which is currently where they're trying to escape from. So, uh, with that, if you are able to join the Discord. Uh, there's a lot of things for everybody to do. You can join as the Vanguard, which are the PCs that play in my campaign. Uh, all you got to do is roll a high number, and you are included in the campaign that week. Uh, or you can play as the Ravenous, which the Ravenous are actual people, but they control all of the monsters in the game. Uh, last week, Horsenio and Night Haze uh, played as the Ravenous, and they were the monsters that attacked the PCs. They downed one PC, they nearly killed another. It was it was rough, but uh, they they did incredibly well. Everybody had such a wonderful time. Um, I really hope that you are able to join as well. Uh, yeah. I'm also going to drop my socials. I'm doing my best to... Sorry, social... <laughs> so new video is saving up for Unleash the Archers, which is a uh, longbow attack on all the people on the screen. Um, I really, really hope that you all are able to join us uh, for the Thursday campaign, either as players or as viewers. And I wish you all all the best. Have a wonderful night. Uh, I am going to see who we can raid so that I can give you all 250 more of those trouble bubbles. I have a few of my friends that are still up and around. Let's see who we have. Um, so this is a new friend of mine. Uh, this is Fluffy Flippin' Fox. She's fantastic at what she does. Uh, she is using um, coaster... Planet Coaster to make a three-dimensional, fully special effect uh, world, and it's gorgeous. It is, it is where I hope that my world building will take me someday. But after discovering her stream, it was phenomenal. So raid, fluffy. Good lord, how do I even spell her name? It's such a long, hard thing. Fluffy Flippin' Fox. 
Red time, red time, red time, red time, red time. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you all so much. I will see you uh, tomorrow on my next stream. It's going to be happening at 3 p.m. or around that, uh, depending on what I have to work out that day. And uh, I am really looking forward to making all this new content with you, my great community. Thank you all so very much. Have a wonderful day. Jazzy play it. Judges Fluffy. You played some Fall Guys as well, Bug Catcher. Is it that fun? I do know judging. It was too, okay? I just jumped back in and I heard my name. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, I, I mean, like I said, I, I, I told you guys. So you don't believe me. And then the man Kill Kill comes in and clarifies. Like, thanks, guys. Forget it. No more Fluffy talk about adventures. I'm just putting myself offline and then... And then offline of everything else, my gosh. You know, just, that's what's gonna be, the, it's gonna be the new normal for this. All right, come on, I'm good, all right. No more fluffy lore, no more fluffy lore, no more adventures of fluffy after stream. Like, I'm not telling you guys. Oh, who kills people in his streams? A bad guy? Instead of like a bad guy, it's a bad guy. Oh my gosh, <laughs> Lance. Um, you wanna try, but I feel like it won't be worth the cost. Well, I'll tell you what, we'll stream it tomorrow and then we'll see how it is. Fluffy flipping adventures. Imagine having fun. Imagine having fun and then people just are like, Fluffy, wow, you're playing this again. I cannot believe the audacity. Shouldn't you be sleeping? <laughs> like, excuse you, let me just have some fun. <laughs> Like, let me live my life, you know? Let me let me be the... I, I, you know, I'm, I'm in my 20s. Oh, I'm an adult. Goodness. I can be... I can go play whatever the heck I want to play. No, I'm just teasing. But I'm definitely not going to keep telling you guys when I go to bed or, like, when things are things. I just am going to be quiet and be like, no, nah, today's totally fine, you know? I didn't stay up late. It's just my eyes just squinting. No, nah, I didn't stay up late whatsoever. <laughs> I don't know what you guys, guys are talking about. Find out next time I'm fluffy after dark. Oh, <laughs> Oh man, you put five hours into the game already? Really? What is fun? Movie night is different. Well, we can still hang out on movie night, but afterwards I'm gonna be like, I'm offline guys, see ya. <laughs> nope, not telling you guys anything anymore. <laughs> oh man, it could be worse, Fluffy. Jazzy had a wooden foot last night? What, a wooden, what do you mean? What do you mean a wooden foot? I'm not sure what you're talking about. How does the penguin build a house? It glues it to ah, that's funny. In her twenties, what fun! I only know of boredom. Oh no, sassy emote. I knew she was in her twenties, meme. You liar! Wait, what? Did wait? Did meme say I was not in my twenties? How the heck do I not? Look? I look like I'm in my twenties. Come on now, come on. Nervous eye twitch. Everything, everything's going great, guy. Oh man, Jazzy and the wooden. I don't know what you mean by the wooden foot. The f you mean, kill kill. Feel like she's driving at me. I keep being a butt sometimes. No, I'm being a. I'm talking about here on stream. Like I'm talking about everybody. <laughs> this is all everybody here. It's not directed at you, Varus. No, 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 no. I, that's not what it's intended to be. But you are. You're. You're the one that's putting it to yourself. I can't help you doing that. If you do that, but I, it's not, that's not what I'm saying. You look older than Fluffy. You pancake. Mm -mm. It's one of those three games. Oh, hey! Um, Bizar Bizarcus? I hope that's correct. How's it going? Welcome on in! One of those games I feel like 20 minutes, but three hours have gone by. Really, Bugcatcher? I'm excited to check it out. Not just you, Varus. I feel that- You guys are literally putting this jab to yourselves. Like, I am not- Like, uh-uh. Oh, is it battle time? No, 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 no. Raid time. Welcome on in, guys. How is the stream? I'm stirring the pot. Meme said nothing at all. Oh, I see. Okay. Movie night on Discord. People texting each other from the start to finish. I mean, 
Yeah, I mean, people want to text each other during that. That's fine with me. I feel silly. I type flipping wrong. Oh, no. Did you put an extra I in there? But, dude, welcome on in. How was your stream? What were you playing? Early 20s. Oh, good. Yeah, that's, yeah. Need a hint? Uh, I'm going back to Fire Temple. I'm going to go full clear that and see what's there. Yeah. Uh, unless it's on Skulltulas. If it's on Skulltulas, please tell me. <laughs> First day I dropped by those four years ago. Aw, thanks, Mario. Shredder can be a butt, but he won't be a butt about some things. Yes, thank you. <laughs> but they look my age. It's, just... it's 50... It's on 50... Wait, wait. Is it on 50 skulls? You know I'm gonna quit, right? I'm not gonna be searching for 50 skulls when skull tokens are shuffled. Please tell me it's not... Please tell me I did not just... Spend And four hours and 20 minutes, basically. Shuffles on. 